Hello friends, welcome back. We're reading The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and this is chapter five. So to recap, Edmund and Lucy have just stumbled back out of the wardrobe into this world, and this is where we find ourselves now. Chapter four is entitled, Back on This Side of the Wardrobe. Because the game of hide and seek was still going on, it took Edmund and Lucy some time to find the others. But when at last they were all together, which happened in the long room where the suit of armor was, Lucy burst out. Peter, Susan, it's all true. Edmund has seen it too. There is a country that you can get to through the wardrobe. Edmund and I both got in. We met one another there in the wood. Go on, Edmund, tell them all about it. What's this all about, Ed? Said Peter. And now we come to one of the nastiest things in the story. Up to that moment, Edmund had been feeling sick and sulky and annoyed with Lucy for being right. But he hadn't made up his mind what to do. When Peter suddenly asked him the question, he decided all at once to do the meanest, most spiteful thing that he could think of. He decided to let Lucy down. Tell us, Ed, said Susan, and Edmund gave a very superior look as if he was far older than Lucy, though he was really only a year different. And then, a little snicker and he said, oh yes, Lucy and I have been playing, pretending that all her story about the country and the wardrobe is true. You know, just for fun, of course, there's nothing there really. Poor Lucy gave Edmund one look and rushed out of the room. Edmund, who was becoming nastier and nastier every minute, thought that he had scored a great success and went on to say that there she goes again. What's the matter with her? That's the worst thing about young kids. They always, look here, said Peter, turning on him savagely. Shut up. You've been perfectly beastly to, you, to Lou ever since she started this nonsense about the wardrobe. And now you go playing games with her about it and setting her off again. I believe you did it simply to spite her. But it's all nonsense, said Edmund, very taken back. Of course it's all nonsense, said Peter. That's the point. Lou was perfectly all right when we left home. But since we've been down here, she seems to either be going queer in the head or else turning into the most frightful liar. But whichever it is, what good do you think you'll do by jeering and nagging at her one day and then encouraging her the next? I thought, I, I thought, said Edmund, but he couldn't think of anything to say. You didn't think anything at all, said Peter. It's just spite. You've always been a little beastly to anyone smaller than yourself. We've seen that at school before now. Do stop it, said Susan. It won't make things any better having a row between you two. Let's go find Lucy. It was not surprising that when they found Lucy, a good deal later, everyone could see that she had been crying. Nothing they could say to her ever made any difference. She stuck to her story and said, I don't care what you think. I don't care what you say. You can tell the professor, or you can write mother, or you can do anything you like. I know I've met a fawn in there, and I wish I'd stayed there, and you were all beasts. Beasts! It was an unpleasant evening. Lucy was miserable, and Edmund was beginning to feel that his plan wasn't working at all as he'd expected. The two older ones were really beginning to think that Lucy was out of her mind. They stood in the passage talking about it, in whispers long after she had gone to bed. The result was the next morning they decided that they really would go and tell the whole thing to the professor. He'll write to father, and if he thinks there's really something wrong with Lou, said Peter, it's, it's getting beyond us. So they went and knocked on the study door, and the professor said, come in, and got up and found chairs for them, and said that he was quite at their disposal. Then he sat listening to them with the tips of his fingers pressed together and never interrupting. So they had finished the whole story. After that, he said nothing for quite a long time. <clears throat> then he cleared his throat and said the last thing either of them expected. How do you know, he asked. 
that your sister's story is not true. Oh, but, began Susan, and then stopped. Anyone could see from the old man's face that he was perfectly serious. Then Susan pulled herself together and said, but Edmund said that they had only been pretending. That is a point, said the professor, which certainly deserves consideration, very careful consideration. For instance, if you will excuse me for asking this question, does your experience lead you to regard your brother or your sister as the more reliable? I mean, which is more truthful? Well, that's the funny thing about it, sir, said Peter. Up until now, I'd have said Lucy every single time. And what do you think now, my dear, said the professor, turning to Susan. In general, I'd say the same as Peter, but this couldn't be true. All this about the wood and the fawn? Well, that's more than I know, said the professor. And the charge of lying against someone who you've always found to be truthful is a very serious thing. A very serious thing indeed. We were afraid it mightn't even be lying, said Susan. We thought there might be something wrong with Lucy. Madness, you mean, said the professor quite coolly. Oh, you can make your minds easy about that. One only has to look at her and talk to her and see if she's not mad. But then, said Susan, and stopped. She had never dreamed that a grown-up would talk like the professor and didn't know what to think. Logic, said the professor, half to himself. Why don't they teach logic in these schools? There are only three possibilities. Either your sister is telling lies, or she is mad, or she's telling the truth. You know she doesn't tell lies, and it's obvious that she's not mad. For the moment, and unless any other further evidence shows up, we must assume that she's telling the truth. Susan looked at him very hard and was quite sure from the expression on his face that he was not making fun of them. But how could it be true, sir, said Peter. Why do you say that, asked the professor. Well, for one thing, said Peter, if it was true, why doesn't everyone find this country every time they go into the wardrobe? I mean, there was nothing there when we looked. Even Lucy didn't pretend that there was. What does that have to do with it, said the professor. Well, sir, if things are real, they're real all the time. Are they? said the professor. And Peter didn't quite know what to say. But there was no time, said Susan. Lucy had no time to have gone anywhere. Even if there was such a place, she came running after us the very moment we were out of the room. It was less than a minute, and she pretended to have been away for hours. That's the very thing that makes her story so likely to be true, said the professor. If there really is a door in this house that leads to some other world, and I should warn you that there is, this is a very strange house, and even I know very little about it. I should not be surprised to find that the other world had a separate time of our own, so that however long you stay there, it wouldn't take up any time of our own. On the other hand, I don't think many girls of her age would invent that idea for themselves. If she had been pretending, she would have hidden for a reasonable amount of time before coming out and telling her story. But do you really mean, sir, said Peter, that there are other worlds all over the place, just around the corner, just like that? Nothing is more probable, said the professor, taking off his spectacles and beginning to polish them, while he muttered to himself, I wonder what they do teach them at these schools. But what are we to do, said Susan. She felt that the conversation was beginning to get off point. My dear young lady, said the professor, suddenly looking up with a very sharp expression of both of them, there is one plan which no one yet has suggested and is well worth trying. Well, what's that, said Susan. We might all try minding our own business. And that was the end of that conversation. After this, things were a good deal better for Lucy. Peter saw to it that Edmund stopped jeering at her, and neither she nor anyone else felt inclined to talk about the wardrobe at all. It had become a rather alarming subject. And so for a time, it looked as if all of the adventures were coming to an end. But that would not be. The house of the professors, which even he knew so little about, was so old and famous that people from all over England used to come and ask permission to see it. It was the sort of house that is mentioned in guidebooks and even in histories, 
Well, it might be for all manner of stories were told about it. Some of them even stranger than the one I'm telling you now. And when parties of sightseers arrived and asked to see the house, the professor always gave them permission. And Mrs. McCready, the housekeeper, showed them around, tell them about the pictures and the armor and the rare books in the, in the library. Mrs. McCready was not fond of children and did not like to be interrupted when she was telling visitors all the things that she knew. She had said to Susan and Peter almost on the first morning, along with a good many other instructions, and please remember, you're going to keep out of the way whenever I'm taking a party through the house. Just as if any of us would want to waste half a morning trailing around with a crowd of strange grown-ups, said Edmund, and the other three thought the same. That is how the adventures began the second time. A few mornings later, Peter and Edmund were looking at the suit of armor and wondering if they could take it apart into bits. And the two girls came running into the room. Look out, here comes the McCready and the whole gang with her. Sharp sword, said Peter, and all four made off through the door at the far end of the room. And when they got out into the green room and beyond it, into the library, they suddenly heard voices behind them and realized Mrs. McCready must be bringing her party of sightseers up the back stairs instead of up at the front stairs like they had expected. And after that, whether it was that they had lost their heads or that Mrs. McCready was trying to catch them or that some magic in the house had come to life and was chasing them into Narnia, they seemed to find themselves being followed everywhere. Until Susan at last said, oh, bother those trippers. Here, let's get into the wardrobe room until they've passed. No one will follow us in there. But the moment they were all inside, they heard voices in the passage and then somebody fumbling at the door and then they saw the handle turning. Quick, said Peter, there's nowhere else, and flung open the wardrobe. All four of them bundled inside and sat there, panting in the dark. Peter held the door closed, but did not shut it. For, of course, he remembered, as every sensible person does, that you should never shut yourself up in a wardrobe. Tune in next time for Chapter 6. Oh, hi there. I hope that you're enjoying David Reed's Narnia. My plan is to record and publish about three chapters per week until I finish every chapter in all seven books. Now, if this goes well, I'll start giving away Narnian relics and souvenirs that I've collected over the years. And these, of course, will go to my patrons. So if you want to become a patron and get early access to the episodes and some other really cool benefits... Find the link to become a patron. I think you're going to like it here.